Hello, Happy New Year, everyone. This is video number five of the series of creating a 6800 CPU on an FPGA using NMyGen. So I'm going to try to keep these videos down to about half an hour each. Um, I think that the format of going way more than an hour is probably just way too much. So this uh, necessarily means that a lot of the coding will be skipped and you know a lot of the intermediate steps about debugging are also going to be skipped. Uh, and I'm just going to show probably the most interesting parts. So that's what this video is going to be about. I add a few instructions, namely store A, uh, store accumulator, and I also upgrade all of the existing instructions to handle not only accumulator A, but also accumulator B. This is exciting. Uh, so I guess uh, let's just go straight to the video. Again, uh, Happy New Year 2020, and let's hope that the year brings perfect vision. So before we get started, I just wanted to show you this one file that I wrote, uh, and it basically uh, implements the CPU that we've been writing on the Lattice ICE 40 HX 8K evaluation board. And the reason that I did this is not to see whether it worked or not, but I wanted to see how big the result in terms of LUTs and cells uh, is currently so that as we go along, we can sort of compare uh, by adding instructions, how many extra LUTs did we use, how many extra flip-flops and so on. So basically what I did is just as we saw in um, the, I think the second video or first video maybe. Um, so I create my platform and these are the resources over here that I'm defining. Now, I've defined this utility class, utility function called bus, and what it does is it basically makes numbered resources. So, for example, uh, this is the name of the resource, ADDR, and the number of pins is the number of those resources. So, this first pin is address zero, this next one is address one, and so on to address 15. And all this function really does is it creates those resources one by one. So we have a resource for clock one and clock two, that's going to be our clock phases, phase one and phase two. And then there's this global reset. Now I've chosen to place clock one, clock two, and reset on these global pins or globally buffered pins because of course they're going to be um, used by many, 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 many flip-flops. So it's going to have to have a huge fan out, which means using a buffered pin. So here's the bus for address. Here is the bus for data. Notice the data is IO. And uh, here's just an extra bunch of debug pins that I put out. Um, this is just going to reproduce the reset state that I can, so that I can make sure that if I actually put it onto the board and look at the reset state pins, I can see that it goes from zero to one to two to three, and then it stops there. Um, and then uh, there's the read-write pin, which because we're outputting it, I may as well assign that to a pin as well. So the default clock is clock one, um, and the default reset is just reset. There are no connectors and everything else is basically the same. So in terms of the actual code, uh, this is the module that sort of envelops the core. There's core right there. So we can see that I'm creating two clock domains uh, instead of one. The first one is phase one, which is on the positive edge, and the second one is phase two, which clicks over on the negative edge. So I get the signals for those, um, I, I get the pins for clock one, clock two, and reset, and then I assign the pins to the signals. So for example, clock one dot I, that indicates that this is an input pin, um, that gets uh, set to phase one dot clock, clock two dot I gets set to phase two dot clock, and the resets for the clock domains all get set to the global reset. Now, to hook up the address lines, I just iterate through the uh, address uh, resources. 
So here's how you get address and pins 0 through 15. And then for each one of those, uh, I assign the CPU's address line to that pin's output. Uh, the, the data is just a little bit different. Of course, we request data 0 through 7, um, and CPU's data outline is assigned to the pin's output. However, the pin's input is assigned to the CPU's data inline, and you choose between the two by setting pin OE, uh, which is simply set to the negative of CPU.RW, because if CPU RW is 1, that's a read. And if CPU RW is 0, that's a write. Uh, so if it's 0, then we want the output to be enabled, which means that I have to invert CPU read write. Um, this is in case I decide to actually put it on the board. Uh, I just have a fake memory. That way I don't have to bother with programming an external ROM. It's just right there in the FPGA. Um, this is hooking up the reset state, hooking up the read write line, and that's really all there is to it. So let's go ahead and compile this and see what we get. So all we have to do is run the Python file and the output appears in the build directory. And as before, there are plenty of files here. The bitstream is top.bin, uh, but really I want to look at top.rpt. So if we look at top.rpt and go all the way down to the bottom, we can see that our current CPU, as it is now, is using 167 LUTs, 282 total cells. Uh, 14 of which are carry units. So that's interesting because of all my belly aching about uh, having PC equals PC plus one all over the place, uh, it doesn't look like it actually um, either used a whole lot of addition units or, or what. So I don't really know what's going on there, but okay. Uh, the other interesting thing is in top.tim, which is actually the timing report. And if we go down near the bottom, uh, let's see if we can find this. So these are critical path reports. And what it does is it basically goes from an input to an output and sees or estimates uh, the time that it takes for the signal to go from one end to the other. And this is the interesting bit right over here. It basically says that you can run the clock at 126.68 megahertz at top speed. So that's a lot faster than the original 6800. So maybe let's definitely load up the CPU onto the FPGA board and see what happens. Now the ROM, the fake ROM, is just a vector that jumps to 1234 when the program starts, and then at 1234, we just jump back to 1234. Now, this is a three byte instruction, so we would expect to see the address lines go from FFFE to FFFF in order to load up the start vector, and then to 1234, 1235, 1236, and then back to 1234. So let's hook up the board. And what I've done is I've hooked up the LEDs to the low byte of the address lines. So we should be able to see exactly what happens. All the LEDs go on, then one of the LEDs to go off, that's FFFE, and then we should see 3, 4, 3, 5, and 3, 6. Okay. Uh, and I got that backwards. It was FFFE to FFFF and then 3, 4, 3, 5, 3, 6. So um, I've also implemented this as a 1 hertz clock. So we can see that the CPU is actually executing properly. Great. So let's take a look at the instructions that we've implemented out of the extended group. Uh, so we've already done jump, and we've done five out of the 10 
of these instructions in the next block. So why not just complete the set? So we will implement and bit compare exclusive or and or. So here's the ALU and I've made some modifications. I've added the functions that we want to implement. Uh, so first thing that you'll notice is that bit is actually the same as and, it's just that you don't store the result. Uh, basically bit is a bit test instruction, so it just sets flags and it does exactly the same thing as and. Same thing with compare. Compare does exactly the same thing as subtract, except that the output isn't stored. You only care about the flags as a result. Uh, and bit and compare are typically followed up by a branch instruction, which would look at the flags. Uh, so I've added and, exclusive or, and or a. And one thing that I made, one change that I made is to load. So instead of taking its input from input one, I've changed it to input two. I just wanted to make it a little more regular because the operand for the ALU always seems to end up on input two. So for example, for add, it would be the accumulator on input one and the operand on input two. Same thing for sub subtract, the accumulator is on input one and you're doing input one minus input two and the operand ends up on input two. So I wanted to do the same thing for load. So when you load the accumulator, uh, input one doesn't matter, uh, and input two is going to be the thing that you want to load into the accumulator. So here's and, xor, and or a. Um, they're pretty straightforward. The flags are set according to the table, which means that v is always reset, the negative flag is always set to the high bit of the output, and the zero flag is always set if the output is zero. Now let's take a look at the core. So I've made another bunch of modifications here. So first of all, I've added all of the instructions that we want, but second of all, you'll see that the calls to implement those instructions are a little different and they are definitely more regular. So instead of having one function per instruction, I realized that all of these instructions basically do the same thing. Effectively, they put the accumulator on the ALU's input one, the operand on the ALU's input two, and then they possibly store the output of the, of the and then they possibly store the output of the ALU back into the accumulator. So that doesn't happen in two cases, namely for compare and bit. So I have this extra Boolean flag called store, which is by default true. And the second thing is, is that the only difference, the only other difference is the function that the ALU is supposed to execute. So why not just coalesce all of these into a single function? Again, we're not optimizing or refactoring at the hardware level. We're doing this at the Python level. So there, there may still be hardware optimizations to do, but we're not going to do that now because that would just get way too confusing. So here's the new super instruction for the ALU operations. Basically it just takes the function and whether you want to store the input or not. Um, we are always going to set mode extended. We are always going to read the operand of the instruction into source 82. And we are always going to put the accumulator onto source 81 and then execute whatever function we said we were going to and then possibly store the result back into the accumulator. Now for load, note that we are still putting the accumulator on source input one, and this is why I changed the ALU to load from source input two, which is the operand. So for load, we're just ignoring this, which is fine. Again, I just wanted to make it more regular. Uh, the only other thing that I did was I alphabetized these functions so that they're a little maybe easier to find. 
um, if you were just scrolling back and forth. Obviously, if you have a an IDE where you can just you know go to the definition, it's right there. So now, in terms of formal verification, we can see over on this side of the IDE that I have added a whole bunch of formal verification files for and, bit, compare, XOR, and OR. Uh, let's take a look at AND. It's fairly straightforward, right? Um, all of these registers do not change. Uh, because we're doing mode extended, this hasn't changed from any of the previous files. There's input one, it's A prior to the instruction. There's input two, it's the operand. And the output is just um, whatever the um, whatever the accumulator is afterwards. And I set the Z flag if the output is zero. I set the N flag if the high bit of the output is set. And I reset the V flag. And then I assert that the output, that is the accumulator after the instruction, is equal to the input one logical ended with the input two, and then I assert all the flags. So this is fairly straightforward. Let's look at a slightly more complicated one, which is compare. So for compare, basically the same thing happens, except of course A doesn't change since we're just doing a compare. Input one again is the accumulator and input two is the operand. Now, I've defined these two other signals called signed input one and signed input two. So it's basically just a straight up copy of input one and input two, except that these are signed signals. So this is the indication to nmygen that whenever operations are carried out, it should carry them out signed instead of unsigned. Um, and that really matters for just comparisons. So for example, the Z flag, the zero flag, is based on input one minus input two is zero. In other words, input one has to be equal to input two for the zero flag to be high. That's pretty straightforward. The negative flag is not negative in the sense of less than zero. In other words, if you take input one minus input two and then do a less than zero, well, that does actually work, but it's a, it's an unsigned comparison in that case. So I could just as easily have done input one minus input two. Well, I couldn't do this because, well, it's these are unsigned signals. So two unsigned signals, they'll never be less than zero, no matter what you do to them. So, so instead, this is what I did. Um, and it's basically the same thing for formal verification with subtraction. It's just input one minus input two, and then you just take the high bit. Okay, so that's N. And there's a little uh, explanation here about why you can't just take the signed inputs and then compare them to see if they're less than zero. It just doesn't work because N is based on unsigned comparison. Okay. Now, if you look at this chart of branch instructions and what tests they do on the flags, you can see here that branch if greater than or equal to zero, and remember that this is a signed comparison, is equivalent to XORing the negative flag with the overflow flag and checking to see that it's zero. In other words, checking to see if N is equal to V. So remember that that if input one is greater than or equal to zero as a signed comparison, then N has to be equal to V. Okay, and I write this down over here, that greater than or equal is true if and only if N is equal to V. So again, this is a signed comparison. So I just set up a, um, this isn't even a signal, it's, it's just an expression. Uh, so I'm checking signed input one is greater than or equal to signed input two. So V, if greater than or equal to is true, V is equal to N. Otherwise, it's the opposite of N, and that's the V flag. Now, notice that I didn't do this in the ALU. Again, this is the philosophy of writing it once and then writing it in a different way using different calculations in order to formally verify that you've done the right thing, or at least you're consistent.
Okay, and this is the carry flag. Um, so the carry flag is going to be true if um, input one is just less than input two. This is an unsigned comparison. So, and that's the only formal verification that you have to do. You have to check that these four flags are correct. And in fact, they are when you run through formal verification. So I'm just going to run formal verification on compare. Okay, the cover statement worked. And bounded model checking worked as well. Now again, this, this doesn't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that compare actually works. It just means that the tests that I've written uh, or the assertions that I've written pass formal verification. And again, because I've implemented compare effectively in two different ways, it means that my thoughts about compare are consistent. And a lot of what I've written in the code comes straight out of the documentation for the 6800 processor. So again, I can be pretty sure that I've implemented subtract and compare properly. So I won't bother going through all the other formal verifications because they work just fine. This is part of a reference card or poster that I've been working on for the 6800. Uh, and this basically shows the grid of the opcodes. So for example, 0, 1 is a NOP. Uh, what are the other ones that we did? Uh, we did jump extended, so that's 7E. Um, so you can see here all of the instructions from 0, 0 to FF. Uh, the ones in black are the ones that are not documented. Uh, so one of the more famous ones is HCF or halt and catch fire. Uh, this is either AD or uh, looks like B, uh, DD, um, not sorry, 9D or DD. And what HCF does is it just makes the address lines increment every cycle, and it just keeps doing that until you reset the processor. Um, and it's said that that was sort of like a little test mode that they added to the 6800. Uh, NBA, I found in some article or other about the 6800, and they said that this is uh, you and B with A, and I think you store it back into A. Um, and BRN is an instruction that I verified on the uh, transistor level 6800 um, simulation that visual6502.org has. Um, if you look at the branch instructions, you'll see that every instruction comes in pairs um, and one is just the negation of the other. And BRA is branch always, so it would make sense that BRN is branch never. Uh, so that's the branch never instruction. Um, this set over here, I actually determined is subtract with decrement. So it's as if you were doing a sub, uh, it's as if you were doing a subtract with carry instruction, except the carry would always be set to one before you did the subtraction. Um, but in any case, uh, we can now look at uh, the instructions that we have implemented, which I've highlighted in green here. Okay, so there is NOP, and there is the jump, and there are these instructions. So we can look at this table and sort of decide what we want to do next. I kind of want to do store A next because there's a, there's a hole in our implementation. So why not, why not do store A? Okay, so here is store accumulator. Uh, there is the extended mode. Uh, B7 is what we're going to be implementing. It just takes the accumulator and stores it into the memory location given by the operand, uh, which is, of course, kind of the opposite of what LDA does. Uh, and if we look at the flags, it is exactly the same as LDA in that the V flag is always reset and the N and Z flags are set according to the accumulator. So let's take a look at how many cycles the thing is supposed to take. Okay, so here is store A for extended, and we can see that it is supposed to take five cycles. 
so it looks like uh, the read write line is actually set to zero, which means that we're doing a write. Um, or actually, is this the read write line? Let's see. Yep, that is the read write line. So the read write line here is set to zero, so we're doing a write. Uh, this is actually the valid memory address. So it looks like there is actually one cycle here where we are loading up the destination address on the address lines, but we are not yet ready to do the write. Uh, and this is over here on the next cycle where the data is actually put onto the data lines and, uh, and a write occurs. So let's see if we can code that up. So the first thing that I've done is I've copied um, ALU extended and I've substituted read byte for exactly what it does. That's basically down here uh, because of course we're not going to read a byte, we're actually going to write a byte. So during cycle two, uh, of course, during cycle two, we want to get ready to set the address lines to the operand so that on cycle three, and remember that in the documentation, cycles are one based, which is kind of unfortunate. So here cycles are two based. So during cycle three, which is actually the documentation cycle four, uh, which remember had that valid memory address to zero and nothing actually happened during cycle three. So yeah, so nothing actually happens during cycle three. So, um, however, we do probably set things up for a write. And of course, now we also need to output what we want to write on the data outlines and what we want to write out is just self dot a uh, so we don't need that now this is going to be set up during uh, cycle three which means that on cycle four which is the last cycle of the instruction uh, this write will actually take place now here for verification we do want to say that we have written something so we're going to write to whatever the address lines are and i guess we need to set up the address lines as well uh, so we're going to write to the address lines this data okay uh, and this is complaining because self.d out is not callable that's because i forgot the equals okay so that's that um, and then we have another cycle at the end. That's not what I selected, was it? Cycle equals four. So this is on the last cycle. Uh, well, I guess that's it. All right, we're just going to end the instruction, I guess. Uh, what else would need to be done? I think that's probably about it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Now, at this point, I did formal verification on store A and it worked just fine, so I was pretty happy. Except uh, when I started to implement the, the B version of the instruction, that is store B into a location, things began to fail and it went rapidly downhill from there. So I did a lot of digging and a lot of rounds of formal verification later, I finally got it to work. And there was just one mistake that really eluded me until the very end of the whole several hours of formal verification. Okay, do you see the error? It's right here. Uh, I should actually be putting uh, the load operand on source bus two, that's input two. So let us run formal verification once more. Cover passed. All right, looking great. Okay. 
Okay, so we finally have a working store A instruction. Now, I do want to point out that when I first implemented the store A instruction, notice that bounded model checking worked just fine. And the reason that it worked fine is that I did not set up formal verification properly. So uh, it fooled me into thinking that formal verification worked. And this can happen with any sort of testing, right? Even unit testing. You, you may write your unit tests wrong and then they will pass. Uh, so too, with verification, if you write it wrong, uh, then verification may very well pass when it shouldn't. Hopefully, as you implement more and more instructions and add more and more things to verification, eventually you'll get to a point where verification fails and then you realize that you've done verification wrong and then you can go back and re-verify everything you've done. So, and then, you know, find more, uh, more errors. So again, just writing formal verification tests is not like a magical wand and all of a sudden everything works. You still have to be careful. Uh, I guess what I want to say is that what the output of formal verification should be better than unit testing. So in other words, formal verification tests a lot more things than unit testing does. In fact, it tests pretty much all of your inputs. And again, if you write the tests wrong, then your output is going to be wrong. But if you're sure that the tests are right, then formal verification has tested all of the inputs, which unit testing would not be able to do. And now this means that we can actually fill in store A extended with green. So we've now filled in this almost the entire row, and there's still JSR, LDS, and STS to do. Um, but I think that what I want to do now is just get a really, really quick bonus uh, and implement the B row um, because really the only difference is uh, accumulator B. So it should be fairly easy to do. Looking at the way that the instructions are encoded, we can see that this entire row basically here uh, has the A register while this entire row here has the B register. So really the only difference is one bit. So we should just be able to change our instructions to check on that one bit and use B instead of A. So looking at the code, so for example for LDA A, LDA B would have this bit position here be a one. So in order to handle both, we're just going to put a don't care in that position. And now, of course, we have to update the comments and the name of the function. Now we have to modify the function. So really, um, we have this uh, statement here, or expression, uh, that we want to get bit 6 of the instruction, which is going to be 1 if we want to use register B, or 0 if we want to use register A. So here's where we're using register A right now. So I can just replace that by a multiplexer. If B is true, then self.B, otherwise self.A. Okay, that's the easy part. Um, the slightly harder part is uh, how to write to A. And one of the problems with using a multiplexer is that you can't use it on the left-hand side of an equate, which is kind of unfortunate, but oh well. I guess we'll just replace it with an F. And that should be all there is to the ALU instruction. Let's do the same thing for store A. Well, okay, all of the tests have now passed. So now let's take a look, uh, now that we've added a whole bunch of instructions, um, let us, let's go ahead and fill in. Okay, so those are now the instructions that we've implemented, so we're getting there. Now that we've implemented all of those instructions, let's try to compile this for the FPGA itself. Uh, what did I do? CPU underscore lattice. 
And let's take a look at how many LUTs and cells we've used. Okay, 527. Uh, that's pretty much a doubling of uh, what happened. Um, okay, that's fine. I'm okay with that. Again, you know, we can certainly uh, do some optimizations after we're done with all of the Python code. Um, so let's also take a look at the timing report. And the timing report now says, oh, oh well, you've only, you're only able to run now at 65 megahertz. Oh, well, um, again, uh, you know, maybe we can optimize that. So I'm totally fine with that. Now, uh, the thing is that our clock frequency was 12 megahertz, and I guess, I'm not really sure what the uh, iStorm tools actually do, but uh, they may actually just uh, use that as a constraint and say, well, anything over 12 megahertz is just fine. Um, so, yeah, I kind of wonder what happens if I set the clock to 70 megahertz. Uh, I'll just go ahead and quickly do that. Okay, just for fun. Ah, well, I guess that means it failed. Yep, the maximum clock frequency was 68 megahertz, so it, it just didn't work. Uh, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, again, maybe optimization will solve this. Uh, so that's where we are right now. How's that, cat?